I'm here with Sophie again today and yeah, strange times of course, but I want to discuss our uh, social media woes and how toxic it is on social media. Just the general feeling about where we think things are at and the disconnect and the thing that's been getting to me so much is, is how, how delusional there's no other word for it is how delusional people are and how out of touch with where we're at. Um, I, it only takes a bit of reading and a bit of Googling. You don't have to be an epidemiologist to know what, where this is going. And I was kind of starting a, a conversation with Sophie about ego. And it's, that's the disconnect as far as I can see. It's ego. It's, we live in a very egotistical time after a very egotistical century, the 20th century. And, and it's, um, yeah, if, if, you, if you saw Adam Curtis's Century of the Self about the 20th century, that's what it was all about. They deliberately atomized us, made us selfish consumers. And it's coming home to roost. Now people, you know, in the middle of this pandemic are clueless. They could just Google what, how pandemics you know, unfold. And it's no great mystery to foretell what's going to happen next. Um, but people are incapable of doing it because they all bound up in their ego and their, their wishes and desires and their self-centeredness. And they buy into this government narrative that, oh, we're still in control. The government's not in control. That's, if there's one thing this virus can teach you is that your ego is not in control. It's basically the virus is in control. Get over it. It's, uh, and that's, that's our hubris. That we think we can beat this. We can fight it. We're, you know, and we rush to the leaders because they tell us they're in control. What this virus is telling us is we are not in control. It is in control. And then you can just look in the history about what happens with uh, pandemics. But Sophie, you're a doctor. What are you, what's your take on that? Well, um, I knew from the beginning that by what I was reading in the in, in the in the scholar article that it was a novel virus number one. So we had to be we were going to be facing a disease that we, we were not used to see. And since the the, the, the sad deaths in, in China, a lot of autopsies have been performed, and a, and a lot of, of accounts of, of, of intensive care doctors have come out to show that it, it is indeed something that we haven't seen before in terms of, I'm not talking about in terms of epidemiology there, I'm talking in terms of basic uh, semiology, medicine. And, uh, and it shows that we are not prepared for, well, doctors are not prepared for this, this sort of thing. So we are just at the early stage of understanding how it's, how it, what's happening in the lungs, the kidneys, the brain, even the digestive system, even the skin. So, um, number one, we don't know where we're going very well. Number two, you're right. Um, it's easy, to, it's easy to, to look at epidemiology and see that a virus doesn't come and go like they're showing everybody with a sort of a little curve. So you want to flatten the curve and then, so we are, and people have associated that with your expectation. It's going to get bad, but it's going to get better and you'll go back to business as usual. A bit like, like the climate. Uh, problem, you know, you're just going to have a Green New Deal and then we can continue, uh, sorry, we can continue the industry, we can, it's, this, it's a parallel, as you said, I think it's a, it's an ego thing again with that virus too. Now, I have another view that I have in them sometimes in the middle of the night is to, to follow the guidance um, of, of the virus. Um, the, the biggest death toll in my country is in nursing homes. Uh, the nursing homes are an absurdity. They're, they're a sign of our decadent or not decadent, but finished sort of civilization where the old are put away instead of being cared for by the community. And the results are immediately in front of you. Where is the virus the worst? In cities. Where, and, and they had to close the schools. Well, schools, in my opinion, are, 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 are just uh, useless and, and uh, and should be, it should be taken into account. Everything you look at, transport to go to work, uh, the virus is pointing, I'm, I'm talking about etiology now. Where, why, is this, why is this virus taking over? Globalization, civilization, cities, organization of work, 
etc etc so i've got two that's my two takes at the moment that's what i'm thinking about yeah, the, it seems to me that there's a, a running theme that I, I try to highlight about boxes and uh, what I call your, our alien cortex, our intellect. It loves to pigeonhole things, shove them in boxes. And if yeah. you look at schools and old age homes and prisons, it's, it's all about, you know, and it's just about getting my problem, labeling it and putting it in a box. And then it's... Anyway. Yeah. It's basically, it's trying to bury all its problems. So it, it buries its social problems in prisons. It buries its old age problems in like nursing homes. It buries the problem that kids are youthful, have energy and have a long, long period before they can actually be put into this labor meat grinder. So then they, you know, box them up in a school. And it's everything's yeah. boxes. It's it's the same on social media. Is everybody wants to put you in a little box. If you If you touch their ego, then they like try and box you up. They say like, the mods should ban. I get this all the time. They report me, complain about, it. put me in a box, label you an eco-fascist and bury you. You know, it's yes. like, you need yeah. to cleanse the environmentalist movement of eco-fascism. I mean, what does cleanse the environment mean other than socially cleanse, just wipe them out, put them in a box, shut them up. You know, everything's a pushing. Yeah control yeah. shutting them up putting them in a box and that's what our alien cortex does to to basically protect its ego and that's mm -hmm. what it's doing in this case it, it's you know how we need a vaccine in other words defeat this thing put it in a box and it's like no you're not going to get a vaccine so can we just talk about the vaccine and why all these shibboleths like you know these kind of talismans these magic talismans like yes, we'll have a vaccine and then we'll kill it. You know, and then we'll put it in a box. Instead of it putting us in a box, we'll put it in a box. And it's like, they already talking about in the box. vaccine and why, why it's just fantasy. Well, you see, the, the, I mentioned to you the other day when we were talking about eight strains, it doesn't mean that there's eight strains of coronavirus, but there is, in, the, in, the, in this type of virus, there is eight strains. Now there's four of the usual flu um, vaccine and there's three that makes seven with the MERS, the SARS, and this one. And they've discovered two recently, two strains in this COVID-19. So that makes eight different ones that you would have to go in, into an anti-flu vaccine because you must not forget that the vaccine that people are getting every year contains um, um, antibodies for uh, different strains of, of viruses. So they're not going to make a vaccine just for the COVID, I suppose. I don't know, but I mean, if, it wants, if you want to industrialize it, and, and Bill Gates, I heard, is coming up with a big plan, um, I, it will, it's, going to, it's, it's, it's not going to be possible to do this for any way. And if, if they want to do it for probably a year and a half, two years, and in the meantime, there will probably be more mutations because we're absolutely in unknown territory. So I agree with you. The jumping to the vaccine is, is, uh, is, a, is a reaction of the ego, and uh, the, the realization of the vaccine seems technologically at the moment very dodgy. I can only see more interest. Like they've managed to sell a lot of chloroquine. The antivirals are going are going quite high too. The business is good. That's one of the only area of business that they can they can work on at the moment. I don't know. The whole problem is skewed. It's completely skewed. I I, I as 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 an ex-doctor, I say an ex-doctor because I've exited, exited from the system because I had enormous questions about it. I am, I, 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 I am happy to say I don't know. I'm happy to say I, I, I think we're going to, towards a, a catastrophe. Yeah, so do I. What I base that on is uh, herd immunity and so let's talk a little bit about herd immunity because the, the it's based on r0 and there's simple calculations for how many people you have to immunize either naturally just because they've been exposed to the virus or otherwise artificially with the vaccine and i think with an r0 of like two to three which is what i thought it was as um I, I think that it meant that you had a uh, herd immunity population of about 70%. Now, yeah. you sent a paper yesterday that said mm -hmm. that it's uh, probably six or seven or, or not. 5.7. 5.7, the last calculation. 
5.7. So then that puts it uh, in that same paper said that the herd immunity would be 82% of the population. Mm. So you, with a vaccine, you have to think, it's not like, oh, here's a vaccine. Now we just have to wave this magic wand. The Pope comes on the balcony at the Sistine Chapel or something or, or at the Vatican, and then um, basically anoints everybody with holy water. And <laughs> yeah. Yeah. You have to roll that vaccine out and inoculate 82% of the world's population. We can't even feed 82% of the world's population, mm -hmm. let alone walk around with a syringe vaccinating people to that extent. The logistics of it is just inconceivable. If you look at something like Jonas Salk and the defeat of polio, it's a tremendous story. And it's a, a, a tiny, tiny fraction of what mm -hmm. it would involve in the logistics of immunizing 82% of the population. Uh, and then there's the issue of the fact that, that it's now starting to look like, um, you know, reinfections are possible. And so that yeah. herd immunity may not be possible. Mm. Um, so what, what do you say to all of that? Well, I've read some papers on, on the serologies of, of people and you want to reach a certain, a certain level of uh, immunoglobin, to, immunoglobin to, 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 to say that you are immune. And it seems like the levels don't get to the right height for 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 a safe immunity, if I may say, I, we have no we have no numbers really. We can just look on a three or four months back, so it's impossible to to make any conclusions uh, from a scientific point of view. But it looks like the trend is that we are not going to be sure that this virus is going to give it. If I catch the COVID tomorrow and I don't get sick, I'm not sure my immunity is going to is going to protect me from a second infection. So we, we're treading on an unknown. If we want to work on a vaccine and we're not sure uh, that the immunity, it, it, it's, it's, it's bullshit at the moment. It's bullshit and it's, it's, all, over the, it's all over the propaganda machine. And, and I suppose people are buying hope. Yeah, it's, it's actually the, the stage for weapon. It's actually at the stage that basically people are asking me to be banned for saying saying this stuff um, uh, because you know they so so don't want to hear it. But um, nobody's citing any contradictory evidence or any paper or any information. Just ban this asshole. You know this is I don't want to hear this. You know kind of stuff. But am I am I right in assuming that if you can if you can be reinfected, in other words, if you can't build up natural immunity to it? Uh, to the virus, then every time you get reinfected, you're just rolling the dice again, presumably with um, the lethality, right? Every time you get it, you it's, a, it's another roll of the dice, right? You've got an even chance uh, of dying from it, and you just carry on rolling the dice. If you get it, you know, every season for three years, you've you've rolled the dice, and if the you know if the mortality rate or the death rate is something like, you know, 7%, then you have a 7% chance each year that you get it. Uh, am I right in thinking that that yeah, but it's, it's very difficult to look back. The only few patients who were reinfected in Japan and China with very little access to the data. We don't know. We, we don't know what it is. But yes, you're right. If you're reinfected, if you're reinfected, every, and, and it's a disease that is, as I said at the start, it's very different from from what we used to see, even the people in intensive care, they're amazed to see that, in fact, it's not really a typical pneumonia that happens. What happens is that there's like a microvascular thrombosis inside the, the tissues of the lung that creates in mini infarcts, like a shower of little, of little thrombies and the, the tissue, fi this fibrosis. So the, the dead space in the lungs increases enormously which explains the, the use of oxygen and ventilators, but actually it's, it has to be very subtle because uh, too much ventilator and you aggravate the problem, not enough oxygen, too much oxygen. It's, it's a big question mark at the moment on this disease. They're discovering things every day. It's, it's, a, it's a really new thing. We have to have an attitude of, wow, you know, wow, we've got, we faced with something totally new. It doesn't give the typical features of pneumonia. It gives neurological signs. Um, 
it gives uh, in, in the brain some lesions have been seen uh, have been seen on autopsy and they've been seen also like like symptoms of a kind of a encephalitis and inflammation um, it, it has some lesions in the kidneys which again if we follow the virus shows us that in fact the people who are the most likely to be having um, fatal outcomes are people with cardiovascular disease who gets cardiovascular disease diabetics obese people people under a lot of stress so the victims of civilization the victims yes. of yeah. civilization like, it's, and, and people are not getting this message people are not get, saying saying that this is you know. a disease of of you know this the epidemics happen the transmission yeah. can only happen with a certain population density what yeah. social distancing is doing is mimicking artificially a reduction in population yeah. so but people won't get this message it's all like oh you're an eco-fascist you say we overpopulated i'm not saying we overpopulated COVID 19 just said you overpopulated and it's saying you overpopulated because it has an r0 of 5.7 it's it's in other words it's saying you, the rabbits in this field are basically overpopulated uh, mm. and they are vulnerable to a disease it's only a matter of time before a disease will thin them out to a social mm. distancing that they should have mm. had naturally so social distancing is not something artificial well it's artificially imposed now but it's it's not something unnatural that's being imposed on us it's something natural that we've ignored yes so and now our separation from nature is 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 highlighted so much there the, the biggest cause of our of our climate catastrophe and and uh, I, 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 the mess of our societies is our disconnection, our separateness from from the natural world, our, our lack of connection, our lack of of understanding of of belonging, and and again you see it in the attitude towards the towards this virus. You know, it's, uh, we're not going with the flow at all. We're resisting. Yeah, is, I, I think that people don't need to know that pandemics came with civilization. There were no pandemics in the hunter-gatherer no. lifestyle. Basically, if, uh, if, if any village got exposed to something like this, if there was a zoonotic disease they got from a hunt or something like that, that village died out. There was never any, any way that they could spread it around the world or to all of humanity. Um, that's, that's kind of like our defense was that we were in little villages. Um, and so we, we didn't provide this kind of fodder for, for any mm. virus to get a hold. And people Absolutely. don't seem to realize that. If, if you say, would you like civilization? Hey, by the way, it comes with things like these pandemics. People would look very different. If you say, do you really want a Green New Deal? Because a Green New Deal is propping up the system that has just now been exposed uh, as unviable due to things like pandemics. So do you really, really want to prop this up again? And people are not saying this, they're not seeing it that way. Nobody's telling them that this is part and parcel of uh, civilization. Yeah. But I wait, can I come back to the, the nitty gritty of the, um, of, uh, the medical symptoms and complications? Yeah. So fibrosis of the lungs then is, um, if you get fibrosis, that's kind of like sclerosis, kind of like hardening of the lungs and they get fibrosis. Mm -hmm. mm -hmm. uh, it, you can't heal from that, right? Once the, the but if it's, if it's a fibrosis that established when there started to be destruction and accumulation of certain tissues, it's irreversible and leads to death, uh, short or long term. And they can be long term, um, actually, uh, uh, complications of this and you can have a lifetime of, 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 of impaired impaired lung function but um, at an early stage they seem to be using steroids at a big massive doses to, to try to, to stop the process of fibrosis in the patients in intensive care and but then what's that actually doing that's that's stopping the growth it stop the, the, the permanent damage to, to establish itself and death to ensue but, uh, so let's go back to the reinfection. If you get reinfected, presumably 
you would keep on getting uh, degraded lung function and you yes. would get damage to the lungs that would you just could, yeah. grow. Yeah. It's basically like scar tissue and each time you got infected you'd you'd get more scar tissue. Like well that? no, you no, you, you get you get lung damage if you get to the stage, you see the disease has got different stages. So you you know you've heard about that everywhere on there's even, even a lot of people now have become experts in infectious disease and epidemiology, but uh, you know you have the symptoms of headaches, temperature, and, and cough, and then after a few days it's fatigue, and then different people have different symptoms. But it's after between six and ten days you can either go bad or just have a medium disease. And bad means that that's when. The, the, the explosion of, of, the, of the immune system creates damage inside your lungs. And that's when you usually end up in, in intensive care, or at least in hospital, like our dear Boris Johnson at the moment. And uh, that's where it's crucial. So if you reach that point that you're hospitalized and you're starting to have shortness of breath and problems with oxygen and all sorts of other problems, because it's very complicated, because with temperature, high temperature, you get loss of volume. So your body is basically going through a terrible storm. So yes, if you're reinfected, but you only had mild disease, you might continue on it for three or four years to get this, this kind of flu every, every year. It's, it's, all, it's all a lottery. It all depends on where you go. But if, you, if your lungs are fragilized after a first, and then you get a second one, who knows what would happen, you know, who so knows? What you're talking about, that storm, is they, they call it a cytokine storm. Cytokine, yeah. Cytokine mm -hmm. storm. So yeah. it's, it's your own immune system basically going all out uh, against yes. the virus, isn't it? Yes. It's basically an massive, massive, yeah. massive inflammation reaction. Mm. Yeah. So uh, yeah. are pe people with uh, reduced immune systems, maybe with chemotherapy and are they kind of protected there or? It depends on what drugs they are. It depends. We have no, we don't, uh, they're not protected. No, they're not because they're usually immunodepressed. Uh, it doesn't mean that they're, they're not going to have this reaction. It doesn't mean that. It's, oh. uh, I think, but I, by what I hear from the, the reports I'm reading from coronas and uh, all sorts of different uh, studies on, on, on dead uh, bodies is that, um, the people who are the most at risk are the people who've got cardiovascular conditions, renal conditions, uh, essentially. Get renal and cardiovascular. It, it, that's what we know. That's statistics. That's just observation on, well, how many uh, deaths have there been now? Where are we? I've lost track of this in the world. I'm, I'm, not, I'm not keeping up because I just don't trust them. You, I've, yeah, I know. It doesn't mean exactly because, well, the death, you have more... The death is a little bit easier to follow than the cases. You yeah, know, but and still uh, put things down to cardiac arrest yeah, and things yeah. like There's that. There's lots of countries who don't keep track of all this, you know. So, but well, people are dying at home, right? So they, they, they yeah. you know, basically, they're not doing autopsies. They'll just put something down as cardiac arrest or something like that. And it won't be yes. Yes. yes, yes, possibly, possibly. So, yeah, I mean, all the figures now are completely bogus. And, and if you think that... Uh, really people can be infected for three weeks or more um you know without mm -hmm. any symptoms but still be contagious yeah, yeah, yeah. it just it makes a whole nonsense about infection rates and stuff like that yeah. and, the, and the incubation too can be two days it can be it can be 18 days so you can carry the virus for 18 days without knowing you have it and suddenly it, it comes out you know it's just so it, there's lots of variation so, so the figures are all bogus, and that's one of the things that I've yeah. learned from reading up in the yeah. history is they traditionally all bogus because there's so yeah. many reasons why the government doesn't want to tell you the real figures. Um, they even, you know, in 1665, the thing that I've just been reading, the Journal of the Plague, yeah, yeah. on the phone, and uh, the thing that stood out for me that's so like today is the people hid it. Uh, they hid the the even households hid it because they didn't want people to know that it'd be stigmatized by the fact that they had a plague victim. So they would pay off the coroner to just put it down as, you know, old age or some other distemper or something like that. And now looking back, you can see that, you know, there were these vast inflations of all these <laughs> disease, all these different um, yeah. 
these different pathologies that clearly were the plague, but they were they were put down there for for reasons of economics and stuff like that. Whole cities would pretend they didn't have the have the plague because of economic reasons, and we're seeing it all playing out again. But what I thought was amazingly consistent is they always seem to rather linearly um, deflate the figures by an order of magnitude. So they just move the decimal point. <laughs> so, so, so I think yeah. a, a good rule of thumb is take an official figure, just move the decimal point <laughs> one space to the left, and you've probably got the reality that they're hiding from you. Um, but yeah, so, okay, so now let's talk about uh, the death rate and lethality because it's when they cover up the death rate uh, um, either through this recording or deliberately or the fact that it's just just hard to keep track um, uh, or actually give give a proper diagnosis or reason for death i think is difficult anyway but uh let's let's just talk about the death rate so what do you think the death rate is now? I mean, China is complete liars. You can just write them off at face value. But if we're looking at somewhere like Italy. Um, yeah, in Italy, it looks very uh, high. Yeah. What do you think the death rate is? Because it's very important to work out the impact of this thing, right? Well, in, in Italy at the moment, I, I haven't I haven't the figures I've had and at mine, but but this rate is enormous. It's ten percent or something, I think. It's getting close to seven point two, seven point two percent. Yeah. So, well, and some some places it's five, some places it's it. But I mean, again, we're back in the numbers because a death rate is the amount of death for for the amount of cases. So if we we don't know the amount of cases, we don't have countries. We've countries who've got we're testing people. The, the country is it's very interesting to look at the statistics from the point of view of per million. For example, cases per million, deaths per million, tests per million. I invite everybody to do that because suddenly you realize that there's there's countries that are testing nearly everybody. So we have a better, we have much better figures from those countries because at least we have a document. Uh, there's very few of those countries who test uh, very high. The Scandinavian, a lot of islands, and a lot of very wealthy countries, Switzerland, uh, you know, places like that test massively. But we we don't know. But the death rate, yeah, it could be it could be seven, eight, nine, ten. In, in it depends. It depends well, on the. It seems to me that the countries that test well are the rich countries that also have good medical medical facilities and yeah. an intact healthcare system. But what I'm pointing out is nobody's looking at India and Africa. And mm -hmm. I'm saying like, if you know Africa, like you know, when I grew up, any African I knew had four diseases that would, you know, simultaneously at one time, that would put you or I out on our back, they would just carry on working because you just had to you just that was life you, you had like four serious medical complaints at any one stage it's just part of life in africa so if you take that people are already uh, not in great health and then you take the, the fact that there is no healthcare system um and people are undernourished um and then you have a lot of aids and there's just so many underlying issues that will amplify the death rate in africa and I'm sorry to interrupt, but also in Western Africa, and West, especially West Africa, there's an extremely high rate of cardiovascular disease due to hypertension. It's genetic. Yeah, I mean, if I think of things, like all these latent diseases that people just live with, everything from, from like latent malaria and Balhazia and things like that, yeah. that people just live with, they're underlying and they flare up every now and again. But I'm just wondering how those people are never going to survive uh, this. So the, the, the death rates in Africa will be many times more. And then the follow on from, from the fact that there's there are no orphanages in Africa. If you, if your parents die, you know, but the kids will die and there's, um, you know, we've broken up all the social fabric. So there are no villages and aunties and uncles to look after people. People are migrant laborers. And uh, yeah. Um, so you have infant death is just kind of, a follow on from that and mm. um and then uh, uh, you know basically it leads to social unrest and there'll be 
lots of debt from that. So, uh, and India is kind of the, the same, maybe not quite as bad, but you know, that's even, even if somewhere like Sweden um, or not Sweden, uh, I think Austria and maybe Denmark are having their exit plans from lockdown. It's like, you can exit all you like. It's, it hasn't gone away. It's just gone to Africa and India and it'll come back again and you'll resume where you started. Is it like that or have I got that wrong? No, I, I totally agree with what you're saying. Plus I'm observing um, uh, the other night I was looking at the, you know that sort of thing on, online where you can see the flights, it's called flight radar. You can see all the planes above the world. And I was looking at the, the traffic, uh, the air traffic over Europe at the moment, which is uh, really, really reduced. If sometimes at some, at any, over Italy or Spain, there's three or four planes, you know. And then you cross the Atlantic and you see that in the US, we're facing the highest amount of cases and death rates and everything. The flights are exactly the same as they were before the pandemic. So it means that it's just like what you're saying for, the, the risk factors in Africa. Maybe they have all those diseases and this poverty and this lack of. But in the states, they're continuing to spread the virus by continuously using air, uh, using planes. You know. It, so yeah, and that's, I don't know why I came to that, but I was thinking about that because it's uh, it's it's it won't go away as long as we as, as long as they still continue what they're doing. It won't go away. Yeah, uh, I I think America. Well, we continue. I think America is going to be punished for for what they're doing, and they're just just um, not taking it seriously enough. Oh, the denial is enormous. Mm. The denial is, is enormous, bigger than in Europe, and it, it's bad enough here. But yeah, yeah. I mean, uh, I think a lot of states are not in lockdown, and um, it's only the East and West Coast that are really in lockdown, um, and then a lot of a lot of them are, you know, states' rights issues and constitutional issues, and libertarian issues, and um, yeah. you know, the, they they're not quite in tune with pr their priorities. I don't. Think. So what about the airports in the states? There's no testing, no quarantine, no. I don't know, no, no, not what happened in China anyway. They they haven't stopped. Seemingly. is mostly um, you know voluntary social distancing yeah. well we know what that means because lots of people don't comply with that yeah well you can't I mean social distancing is I don't put much faith in anyway because it's it's the economy people are exchanging you know, goods and cash, and uh, you know, although they don't have so much cash left in the states, even even using a card, you're spreading things around while you're exchanging money and goods. Is again in that Daniel Defoe um, journal, they they were very smart in 1665. Is they kept commerce going, but they they all the money, you know, there was no paper money. All the money they they exchanged in a jar of vinegar. If you, you paid, you put it in a jar of vinegar and you made sure you had the exact amounts that you were buying so you didn't have to get change because they wouldn't. Ah. Mm. And I thought like, you know, now I'm shopping here in Greece. And it's like the person, the person doesn't have a mask, you know, behind the till and they have gloves on. But then they, you know, I give them the change. They give me the change. I guess it's like, what's the hell? I'm so <laughs> distancing from the person in front of you. I just picked up the money that they just put, you know, wiped their nose with the hand that they paid with. And then, uh, you know, I pick up that cash. It's like, there's no social distance while you've got well, money. No, 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 because we, we, it's nearly impossible to think for people, most people to think local, to think, to think in your your life in your vicinity and, and your your little place. It's impossible for people. Yeah, I know, I know. I've observed that here too, the social. But I do I do believe in, in, in certain certain sides of social distancing to, to reduce the amount of people that you that you will infect. You won't be perfect. But if you even do 75% of, of social of, of what is recommended, you, you can reduce the amount of people infected by a by hundredfold. 
you know, if you if you have no social distancing, you you know that you with the RO that we have now, you will get you will infect two to five people. Those five people are going to you know it's exponential. Um, if you if you reduce the social if you reduce your social interaction, you will you will definitely reduce the whole numbers. But I know there's holes in that. But, uh, but what, what I I I had this, this I've observed this here in a small community too. It's it's um. It, well, it doesn't fit. It doesn't fit the the way people have been living for the last while, and no one they want to question the status quo. No one wants to question what they've been led to believe is the normal way of living. And they want to go back to normal. I hear everybody saying, I "Want to go back to normal?" But how you were living was not normal. But this is the thing that drives no. me: is people will not let go. There's, there's all these underlying no. narratives that they. It's a Stockholm syndrome. <laughs> Well, there's, there's this idea that the norm is this completely unnatural thing, and that's that you're supposed to have interaction with strangers on a free basis. And they're saying, no, you're not. That is supposed to be, you know, any, any ethologist or anything will tell you that that's fatal for primates to, to be so promiscuous uh, with, with strangers. And they're, you know, basically troops of monkeys and that are extremely hostile. Intergroup hostility is rampant for a very good reason. And one of them is disease. Uh, it's basically, it's nature's defense to make sure that chimps and primates like us stick around. And that's, they have local communities that are, um, that are, have strong social ties and there's not much uh, outgroup interaction. And now everybody assumes, no, our group interaction is the norm. That's a, no, it's not. You're a primate. That's, that's a highly, highly unnatural and dangerous thing, as we've just found out. Yeah. Yes, and, so, and if, you, if you decide to be a nomadic primate, well, you, you don't travel by plane. You, you just travel slowly on land, on water, at the pace of a human. You don't take big planes and fast cars and things. You know, you just have, yes, it, you're right. Well, there's a very good reason why we, we're not supposed to have vehicles. And that's because if you travel at the, at the rate that you can on foot, uh, sick people don't travel very far. They die on the road. And that's a good thing for everybody. It's natural attrition. It's natural immunity. I suppose. And, um, I suppose. Yeah, it's, mm. it's, it's basically, it's a, it's a good defense against propagating diseases that if, you, if you're strong enough to walk, that's the filter, that's the test. If you're strong enough to walk, then you're strong enough to walk to the next village. Good luck to you. But if, you, if you're sick and you can't walk, well, that's, that's how nature makes sure the next village isn't infected. Now, everybody just plonks their fat ass on a plane now and goes all over the world and infects everybody. Um, just going from plane to car and everything that they, they couldn't they couldn't walk five yards, but they still go around infecting everybody. Yeah. So on that issue, then. Um, yeah, but when I when I when I bring back. No, no, go on, carry on. <laughs> on on that issue, then we mentioned about we're talking to Exile this proposal on Reddit to to actually have cells of of communities uh, that mm -hmm. could freely exchange. Basically, you could have local food production. You could go to the pubs and the restaurants as long as they were in the same immunity circle because mm -hmm. I'm in that right now. I'm, I'm on an island that has zero cases. We're, we're cut off. We only have deliveries from the mainland um, once a day, and that's the only contact. Now, what they're saying here now, the, the lockdown has been extended till May, but there's a debate going on. And the governor has said, you know, basically, we want to just write off this summer and start again next year. So everybody here really survives on the tourist industry. Yeah. And that's what's at stake is the money, is that some mm -hmm. people say, well, we should open in September and just get the stub end of the, the tourist season if we can. Um, but the, I think the, hopefully the consensus is you just stay isolated for a year and pick it up again next year, which mm -hmm. is what I really hope they do because, you know, basically life can go on as normal. The island's self-sufficient virtually or could be. And you could basically do this same island concept in your rural community in Ireland or the UK. 
you could just get up to this town and say, this town is sealed off. It's an island. We don't have any cases. We just go about our business as usual. We make, we grow our own veggies. We have our own internal economy and, you know, we'll, we'll get connected with the rest of the world if and when it's around. <laughs> but, uh, but until then, we're isolated. What, what do you think about that? I feel very comfortable about that. I've been, I've been advocating this from before the virus and for a long, long time. I've lived on an island myself when I was younger. And I know the ways and I know what you mean. Sorry, I just, one minute, excuse me. Excuse me for that now, I had a cat who was... <laughs> <laughs> Yeah. Here's, here's again this Don XR thing. Uh, oh, sorry, I'm listening, but I have to move. I'm listening. Yeah. So here's the damn thing about, you know, XR is that they, they've, they you know, said about regenerative communities and all this. And here's a perfect opportunity to say, now you have to do it. Now you have to have yeah. a local community. Now you have to basically start thinking regeneratively you know this this is a unique opportunity to say that well you have these immunity circles or whatever marketing they want to use um and you know lobby the government to say we we're going to do this whether you like it or not and we want a, an exemption in the law to say that we, we're allowed to have these isolation units basically villages you know tri tribal villages of immunity and that's the first start to a seriously regenerative society but um i i suggested it on reddit I, I sent it to rupert reed he came back and he said yeah this is great this is the same as the idea of a friend of mine he'll um, you know pass it around a bit but it's like all these opportunities uh mm -hmm. for real social change and the whole movement just evaporated it's just like you know it was it's almost like they were exposed by the virus as being a complete sham. Yes, 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 because they're thinking in the paradigm of we, we fix this by, by, win, by wind turbines and electric cars and, and you know, we, we'll be all green and it will be fine. They haven't put in question at all the whole, the whole civilization, the, the, the industry, the, the way we farm, the way we eat, the way we interact between each other is it politics they don't they don't question all that but they're, they're flawed it's flawed from the start the root problem is not addressed but again isn't it funny it's like the virus is showing us where to go yeah you know and it's happening spontaneously here and suddenly i see people doing mutual aid in in the villages you know people are walking and they're talking and they they're off their phone and they're, they're just uh, lending a hand and you know yeah it's if if you are in tune and if you go with the, if you go with the flow you will come to that but you will be there will be big resistance there and i don't know what's going to happen i live in a place too it depends heavily on tourism and uh, when i opened my mouth a few days ago to say well we had to stop uh, people, rich people coming to their holiday homes and bringing the infection to, to this part of the country. There was a, a terrible reaction from, from a business uh, point of view, but those people, they bring money here. We can't just, you know, and it's, it's like that. It's like that. It's, it's all about business and commerce. That's, that's yeah, the yeah. thing. It's basically, it's sanity versus commerce. And, uh, mm -hmm. and right now, people are addicted to commerce. They're addicted mm -hmm. to money. They're addicted to the way of life yeah. around, you know, a job and a paycheck and uh, money. And, yeah. and that's gone. That was, this is the other thing that nobody seems to be listening to me about is that the economy collapsed before the virus. Everybody mm -hmm. thinks that the virus came along and caused huge economic disruption. It's very mm -hmm. easy to come up with a conspiracy theory to say, the virus was maybe uh, deliberate, deliberately done to cover up the collapse of the economy. So basically, the the economy was 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 failing in December. Like I told people, I said, you know, watch out in December. Mm -hmm. I said, people, the, at the end of the year, there's going to be a reckoning, and there was. 
nobody got it. They thought this is all, you know, a blowback from the pandemic. And then or the, the natural assumption is as soon as the pandemic's gone, which will happen quickly with a, with a vaccine, then we'll be back to business as usual. The, the, the economy will be back intact. You say, no, the economy independently collapsed. So you can forget commerce and say, you know, we have to lift lockdown to get commerce going again. Commerce wouldn't start again, even without the virus. And I don't think people have got that. They're just not getting how deeply uh, this, this is going to affect history from, from here on out. How, how basically, it's, it's, no, it's a whole new world and nobody gets it yet. I wonder how long it'll be before, before people start to get it. I think there will be pockets, like you say, and some people will start to think uh, with their tribe, whether it's virtual or, or, or real, but, and then it will come from there. All big movements are, are built from the base, and we have to trust the people. And, and I mean, I, I notice here in my area that I, I get a great understanding from people who are deprived and who have very, been used to live in a very simple way and caring for their neighbors. They're, they're well able to grasp what's going on without, without going deep into what and why economy, virus, and all that. They have, they have this deep understanding because they, they live like that every day. They're in contact with the elements, with the sea, with, with nature. And they go, the, there is a few, but don't expect to hear that in the media or in the, you know, in the mainstream media or even the social media. That, that, is, that, that is the, the, the sheep, unfortunately, unfortunately. Well, I, I have an urge to tell people about, um, you know, people that live closer to nature, like sailors, I, I feel like I want to tell people about the sailing community where there's strong mutual aid and this mm -hmm. idea of solidarity. And, you know, if you live aboard a boat, you live closer to nature than anybody. You, have, you look at the weather all the time to see whether you yeah. know, this is the day you're going to get wrecked. And, and um, uh, that, that kind of thing, I think, uh, you know, most people just think, well, I'm a rich bastard on a yacht. And they're saying like, no, some of the people on yachts, are, they're all types, but some of the people mm -hmm. that are sailing are, are penniless. They just dropped out of the system because they couldn't take it anymore. <laughs> they're kind of refugees. And there's a strong feeling of solidarity and community and this idea of being close to nature. Um, and yeah, I mean, uh, people to, or continue trying to be self-sufficient and think, how can we feed ourselves off the sea and <laughs> the rocks? Uh, yes, and you become resourceful. You suddenly tap into, into your, your really, really useful um, senses, you know? I know that for years. I know what you're talking about. Mm. And, and well, people are living on Kairos time and they living, you know, close to nature and they, they feel... I don't know, that's, that's maybe people will find their way to it if they only knew about it. That's what I feel. I feel if people knew about this more, yeah. uh, living, living on the net. Yeah. You know, once you give something a fancy name like permaculture and you start making a big marketing deal out of it, it's, you've, you've kind of lost it. You've already got a whole lot of people that say, you know, I don't like your marketing of the environment. Yeah. It, how do you let people know about this resilient, self-reliant life close to nature without marketing it with some fancy name and books and personalities yeah. around it and make it into a political issue that immediately then gets its opposition? How do you do that? Just say to people, Psst. Well, just like Mark uh, Boyle and say, this is the way home, you know, this is the way home. Over here, go this way, you know. Co coronavirus is a good thing, you know, <laughs> this way, without getting into some political debate or some, you know, religious war or, you know, how do you do well, it? The revolution, the revolution will come from the margin and um, you can but only do it and, 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 and get good at it and, and embark on this with, 
with trusted friends and, and a tribe that is that is ready to embark with you, like in your uh, community on sea and for me and my little tiny little network of people who who have it in them to to, to, to be there for each other. But uh, yeah, how do you? How are you, this little voice in the in the in the in the big silence that's trying to you know it's it, it is a an, it's a thing I think about every day. Well, it's not the silence, the noise. How do you tell people in well, the apartment in New York and London say that? Yeah, that's life is finished. You 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 know. No, but I talk about the silence of people who are online, of people who are at the moment self isolated, who are before that going to work and too tired to you know it's, it's that sort of silence there's, there's no the little, the little amount of meaningful exchanges and, and uh, you know and uh, even at i would say at an emotional level too you know it, it's uh, it's like that so now yeah we're just gonna have to try not to be too much of a doomer on that line or it's 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 difficult <laughs> I'm, I'm encouraged by the, the literature during the Great Depression. There's a whole genre of underground literature in the Great Depression, um, and it's a lot of it dealt with what it was like being on the road and how um, yes. the hobo culture and solidarity started to grow. And mm -hmm. um, I think there's a large body of evidence that one of the reasons why Roose they did Roosevelt's New Deal and why they probably will do a Green New Deal now is because they were genuinely alarmed that the people were losing faith in, in government and in labor and in industrialization and were finding new avenues, basically becoming, you know, those hobo camps and stuff were essentially communists. And that was genuinely alarming. They, they thought the country was going to go the way of the Soviet Union at that mm -hmm. stage. And so that, that's why they uh, did, you know, the, the, the Workers' Act and the TWA, things like that, is because they, they were trying to get people back into the labor market because they were scared that if they got too used to being out of it, they would defect permanently. And I think that's where we might be headed in the next year or so. People, unemployed people will eventually lose, lose faith in... Uh, well, uh, would eventually lose faith in in the system because you know the number of people that have signed on in the last month or so in in Washington State where where I come from the state can't support that they're bankrupt um, nobody knows that yet the federal government is bankrupt uh, so so the state can uh, you know basically can't really just carry on doling out money. Um, indefinitely to keep the consumer economy going. If, if they start doing that, they'll have the different problem, and that's basically people will all be welfare queens, and the, there'll be zero incentive to go back into the factories or when the factories come back to America, which I presume is what they're going to try to do after this. Um, the, you know, they, the, they cannot... The, uh, what I'm trying to say is they, they're in the same position as they were during the Great Depression, is that people will defect um, for just naturally, there'll be a drift away from industrialization and the, the economic capitalism um, mm -hmm. because it's failed them and they will start to find new alternatives and they may never bring them back. And so I it think a happen. lot of encouragement from that. It may happen, but it may be also the case that in these times of, of, of fear that people will, will, will have a tendency to turn to, to daddy and, and say, you know, help me, help me, and, and, and not, not turn to each other. And I, I, I find, I kind of feel that when I, my small interactions I have with the outside world, there's a, you know, there's this sudden trust, the sudden trust in the government, trust in the media that <laughs> You know, it's, it's like a primal reaction, <laughs> and yes, it, it, I'm, I'm, that qu quenches the, the, the local initiatives that you're talking about. Because of the, yes, I'm the, the, to, every, hmm? Everybody rushes to daddy and rallies to the leader and does all that, you know, yeah. primate hmm. brain uh, hmm. instinctive reaction. 
I'm thinking ahead to where daddy doesn't deliver. Daddy's mm -hmm. dead on arrival. And then people are liberated because, you know, I, the, the, in this case, daddy won't be able to deliver. And I think that that's what XR and, and all activist movements should be doing, is making sure that the government cannot deliver. Mm -hmm. We should be trying our best to get to the situation where people break the childish and unwarranted faith in authority figures by making but sure that strikes, authority figures can't deliver. Rent strikes are happening per se now. They are happening without being organized. Well, well, rent and debt strikes will guarantee that the government cannot deliver on, on any kind of social remedy to this pandemic. Mm -hmm. That's why mm -hmm. I keep on pushing them. But they kind of yeah. get, they kind of, everybody is in XR, not keen at all on a debt strike and a rent strike because they like, they kind of like, ooh, don't hurt daddy. He's, he's supposed to deliver us. <laughs> it's like, like, no, yes. this is the time to drive the, <laughs> drive the blade in, you know? Yes. Kill a beast. They don't, they don't want to do that. You have to invent a, a virus, a new virus that is a virus that, that's an anti-daddy. <laughs> yeah. I mean, don't, don't even joke about that. I mean, what are the chances that all these right-wing guys, I mean, how many samples do you have of, I mean, this is basically, let's, let's face it, it's a bioweapon. They can't hide it much longer. It's a bioweapon. So, they, so, so they, you've yeah. basically got a bioweapon in the field. Anybody with a Petri dish and basically a even modest idea about biology can can breed this and mutate it and you know get gain of monkeys. Monkeys. yeah I mean, all, all you all you need is a cage full of 12 ferrets and you could breed the next uh, bioweapon and release it so no, no, but what i what i meant by a new virus an anti-daddy virus is a virus of the mind i think you need to infect people with the idea that the daddy is failing you as always fails you and it's not the way it's not the direction to look at you know, and, and, and but they never, the they never give up on daddy. I mean, look at Trump. He's, 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 uh, you see this thing about this, <clears throat> what's this, uh, this, this thing that he's on about, about, um, what is it? I uh, um, can't remember what is it, Me methochloroline or what, what is it? Um, oh, chloroquine. Yeah, <coughs> chloroquine, the, yeah. The anti paludism yeah. Yeah, anti malaria drug. Yeah. Yeah, I know. He has got he's got shares in this in this company in France that makes it. So <laughs> so there he's he's shouting down um Fauci, who they were asking Fauci, you know, is it true that this is actually a thing? And and he, he wouldn't let Fauci answer. He stepped up and said, I've answered this ten times, you don't have to answer and he's just shut him out. It's like how mm -hmm. banana republic can you get where the president is putting out misinformation on a medical topic because he has a vested interest in this uh, in promoting his stock in some company. I mean it's just actually the, the, actually the people yeah. people are still rallying to him. I mean, they, the, the, the liberals on the left, they don't really give up on it. The mere fact that they keep on lamenting every new atrocity that he does means that they still have faith in him in a bizarre way. <coughs> so they never, they, nobody comes out on mainstream left media and says, guys, we just got to ignore this idiot. Just, just yeah. write him off. Shoot him, let him die, whatever. But just, just ignore him. Nobody says that. They still, oh, Trump should be doing this. Trump should be. It's like Trump shouldn't anything. Just, just turn your back on him, and they can't do it. They still want Daddy to reform himself, and they still want. I, I think. I think a lot of the Russians that have turned their back on Putin and organizing themselves. I think they are. They're having that sort of reaction over there. <laughs> That's what I. And and to come back to that drug, it's being stopped in France because of terrible complications, cardiological complications. They had to stop you. That's where it died from. Yes. <laughs> but, sure? but we're not allowed to talk about that because we don't want stocks, uh, you know, Trump's stock portfolio to take a dive. So that would be all. Mm -hmm. and now he's got 2.3 trillion. He just, uh, that basically, he just fired the, um, the oversight committee that was supposed to, you know, monitor that it wasn't you know, used for 
fraud or waste or you know basically abused he just sent them packing so now he's got 2.3 trillion at his disposal it's just complete you know, it's just like African dictator style. It'll just go straight into his pocket. Vested interests go very far in the medical world too, because don't forget that doctors, um, in our societies anyway, are um, involved in the system as rich people who were planning on big pensions with, well, rich, yeah, rich. Um, planning on big pay pensions that are depending on the economy, uh, which you know who is profiting from that. So it means that we're far away from the, the Hippocrates uh, oath. We're far away from the Roman type of doctor who was paid by the state to pen the same to the slave and, and, and the patrician. We are completely gone into a, a medical world that is also buying into this thing. So. Turning to, I mean, I'm not saying that doctors are not devoted and not compassionate and not, you know, I, I many times encountered wonderful behaviors and I'm not saying that it, but there's a pervasive uh, thing to turn to daddy to there. You know, it's, 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 it's skewed. The, the exclusion of alternative medicine, for example, or free or free medicine, you know, it's immediately suspicious, you know, you, you, I don't know. I, I am, I am, I am not trusting the profession that I was, I was um, trained in at all. You I'm should taking. Yeah. It's like you know. It's like uh, you, you have you have tools there, and it's good to use them. It's good to know them. It's true, but apart from the emergency and and, and a few other things, I, I I have lost total trust in the medical profession. Well, you should, you're lucky you're not in America, because if you were in America, you would just slit your wrists. It's just beyond believable in America. Yeah, I, I, I guess so. I guess so. Mm -hmm. You can't, can't even begin to, to say how bad and corrupt it is. And it's, again, it's, it's as you say, it's built on this childish, naive faith in authority figures. Mm -hmm. And if, if you put all your safety or your money in the hands of some expert, they're just going to take it. They're just going to abuse it. That's the way it is. You know, it's basically, it, it, it might not start out that way, but all the psychopaths in the world, they gravitate to those places where there are naive people handing over cash and faith. And, and that's, you know, mm -hmm. psychopaths gravitate to, to positions where they're priests and doctors and politicians, because this is where all the mugs are. This is where the easy pickings are. The, you know, the vampires hang out there. And the only way you can stop that is by educating uh, the youth to say, you know, don't put your faith in these authority figures. They will abuse it. It's just natural that uh, psychopaths will gather there to, to harvest you if, uh, if, if you give up your, your sovereignty in terms of your sovereign independence in terms of freedom of thought and for, in terms of um, freedom of, of, of conduct in commerce, in terms of um, freedom of thought in religion. If, if you give all those up to somebody else, they're going to abuse them. It's just, it's just the law. It's the law of nature. Um, you know, so I don't see but any... Even, yeah. even universal, universal basic income as, that's looming on the horizon is another allegiance to, to, to power. People think, oh, it's great. We're going to have, we're going to rely on the, on UBI, and everything will be fine. No, it won't. Well, it won't. You, if you go back to Rome and the uh, collapse of Rome, that's exactly what they did. They did a UBI. Yeah, Marcus Aurelius. Yeah, Marcus Aurelius. And then what? What they? What they? They could never back out from it. Once, once you start giving a UBI and you give free money, you you the state can't back away because the riots of, uh, you know, basically people have strong loss aversion. So people will quickly riot if uh, they go about to lose something. People won't riot to gain something. And that's yeah. what the state finds is they're locked into uh, basically these, this uh, socialized, um, basic bread and circuses. And so that's where the government is going to be now is going to be giving people a UBI and they'll never get off that train. Basically, they'll ride that train to collapse, which is what Rome did. Yeah. Yeah. Um, 
Yeah, and then, and then, then quickly it becomes all the patricians start saying, well, we can't just give out this free money. There must be some prid quo pro. And so then you must serve in the army to get it, you know, that kind of thing. And then of course they had to have wars to basically, you know, reduce the size of the army by attrition. <laughs> all these things creep in. Mm -hmm. um, so we'll get that. Yeah. We'll get that. But anyway, so we all point to local solutions tribal solutions and and uh, and uh, you know mutual aid yeah Collective. back away from the state back away from industrialization this is what mm -hmm. nature is trying to tell us and that's i guess what our message is <laughs> isn't it yeah if it makes you feel at peace to think that way because you know it's you know it's right it, you know it's right because it flows it flows and you can you can pass the only pass on the message by doing it yourself yeah, I've I've done it in my way going to sea, and you've done it in your way. Well, partially, but we, you know, and it's a it's a lonely path. But it's sustainable, and it's but, it's kind of yeah. it's rich. In so the, rich. Yeah, it's it's. Nature to me seems like a you know a, a slow movie. It's it's. It's not full of, uh, everybody's desensitized now with all these hyperactive entertainment, modes of entertainment. And nature's not entertaining in that way. It's not entertaining as an amusement. But other human beings are supposed to provide that for you. Mm -hmm. They're supposed mm -hmm. to provide you your amusement and entertainment. And not yeah. Disney and not the big corporations and not nature. Yeah. Yes. I'm confused now that Americans in particular, they go out into nature and they want nature to amuse them, you know, yeah. so that it's almost bear baiting, you know, they get on a, on a wet bike and beat nature into submission and then they, you know, get, get on, you know, off road bikes and, you know, basically it, it climb things and fly over oh, yeah, yeah, yeah. Nature's <laughs> got to entertain me. It's like nature's not, not a good entertainer. You get your entertainment some, from people. Um, so we're all confused, but I think maybe, maybe some people will find their way back. Well, yeah, yeah, yes, yes. Well, so maybe we should leave it at that. Um, yeah, thank you very much. Thank you. Yeah, I'm, I'm gonna go and hike around now. Uh, yeah, I think I'm gonna do the same, waiting for the low tide now and go for a long walk on, on the, along the shore. And, uh, yeah. get, uh uh, seafood and shellfish and stuff. And Probably some seaweed too. Yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah it's a good time of the year for that. That's entertainment. Cooking, oh. eating, hunting, gathering. There's uh, yeah. that's that's the way. I had, a, had a fox visiting yesterday evening. We just just leaped through the and he stayed there in front of the window after a while because he had a bad leg, and he was just so close. And there's so many things happening. Yeah. 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 It's not entertainment. It's real life. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. It's yeah. it's more it's more of a religious experience communing with. Of course. Of course. Yeah. Of course. Okay. Well, wonderful talking to you again, and so. Um, I see you soon. Stay in touch. Yeah. And stay, stay take happy. care and stay sane. <laughs> you too. <laughs> All yes. the best. Okay. Bye bye. Bye. Yeah.